Today is World Vegan Day. If you didn't already know, November 1st. And it is a great day for us to uh, share the benefits of being vegan um, or at least experimenting and exploring vegan, what it is, um, what vegans eat and why. Um, so kind of the short, quick definition is uh, someone that chooses to be vegan does so to avoid consuming animals and animal products, wearing animals, using any kind of animals or animal products in our daily lives as much as is possible within reason. So the main goal is just to be as plant-based as possible, to have as minimal of an impact on the environment as possible. And then of course, another great benefit is to be eating as healthy as possible. Um, so this evening, we're going to be talking about kind of the four main topics that really come up um, when choosing to be vegan. And of course, there is the animal welfare issue, um, the um, health benefits of vegan foods and eating a vegan plant-based diet, the environmental impact of how our diet choices affect the earth, um, in addition, some really kind of specific logistical parts of choosing vegan and how that affects our lives and sort of our day-to-day -day way of living um, and, and how that might impact our families, cultural issues that might come up um, because food, of course, is really more than just what we eat three times a day, what's on our plate. It has so much more to do with how we celebrate, how we live our lives, and um, how we share with other folks. So we're gonna be able to talk about all of these great things this evening with you. Um, we also are gonna have a great Q&A after. So we already have some really great questions that have been submitted earlier. And in addition, we're going to be able to accept questions throughout the presentation. So please be sure to share those with us. And we are gonna have a few polling questions throughout the presentation. So we'd really love it if you would take the time to just respond to those. It's going to help us collect information about everyone that's participating today. And it will also help us in guiding how we talk about certain things and maybe answer some of our questions just to make sure we're addressing um, your needs and interests. Uh, we are going to be muting everyone in the program that isn't currently talking, just so it's really easy to hear everyone. Um, we are going to be posting information about everyone that's participating on our panel today, as well as a really great list of resources to address all of the things that we're talking about this evening. And one other exciting piece to this evening for everyone that's participating live, there will be a $25 Whole Foods gift card drawing that we're gonna do right after the event. Um, so I do want to take a moment to introduce our panelists. Um, they are going to talk about themselves and, and why they're participating tonight. Um, so we've got Thomas Goodman, Dr. Joanne Kong, and Tim Wright. And we also have a wonderful person, Larry, who has put this all together. And I would love for you to introduce yourself first, Larry, before we really start diving in and how much we appreciate you putting all this together for us today. Yeah, good evening, everybody. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, my name is Larry Powell. I'm the Director of Alumni Affinity Programs for the VCU Office of Alumni Relations. And this is the act, this is actually the first VCU World Vegan Day event that I'm aware of. And uh, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Looking forward to um, a very engaging conversation. I wanna thank um, our panelists for participating and really being the ones to make this happen. So once again, you know, I don't wanna uh, delay the start of the program. So thanks again for everyone's participation. Great. Thank you. This is really, really exciting, um, especially being um, an alumni of VCU for both my undergrad 
and graduate degrees, it is makes me even more proud to be able to participate in this in addition to living in Richmond, working in Richmond, and this being my community. So this is really great. Uh, so my name is Chrissy Vandenberg, and I'm the executive director of Vegan Action. And I have been vegan for 26 years. Uh, started in college, I was inspired by some other folks that I met that were vegan for ethical reasons. And it really matched up with my interests and passions and my true love of animals and the environment. Um, and as I learned more, I, of course, got even more interested in the environmental impacts, the benefits to um, food availability globally by choosing a plant-based diet, and all of the other really wonderful benefits that come with those choices. And so I started volunteering with Vegan Action when I moved to the Bay Area in 1998. And I have been with Vegan Action ever since on a variety of different levels while I um, attended graduate school and I actually br briefly taught at VCU and um, worked at a couple of other nonprofits and organizations and then eventually have been working for and directing Vegan Action um, for the last eight years. So it has been really an amazing journey and privilege to have been able to make this my career. And so I'm really grateful. And next, I would love to introduce Dr. Joanne Kong, if you could tell us about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much, Chrissy and Larry Powell, for making this wonderful event possible. Uh, over 20 years ago, I was on the faculty at VCU. Currently, I teach at the University of Richmond. And even though working and teaching as a professional musician is my day job, several years ago, I decided that being an educator, one of the most important and you know, necessary things to do is to share information and educate people about the power of plant-based nutrition. And as you'll hear during this coming hour, veganism, it's so much more than just diet. It affects so many aspects of our lives. It's really about a philosophy of living. In addition to doing a lot of public speaking, my most recent project was a new book just published called Vegan Voices. Chrissy is also in the book and the link to the book is on the resources page. And I wanna mention this book because it features essays from 50 writers around the world. And it shows the personal paths and the wide range of perspectives that brought people to veganism. And one of the writers in the book from India, Shankar Narayan, has this wonderful saying that I hope all of you take with you tonight. He says that veganism is not a destination, it's a journey. My own journey began way back in the mid 80s when I read for the first time what happens to animals in industrialized factory farms. For me, it was a real wake up call. And in my advocacy, I point out that I'm like the prime example, you know, when I was back there as a grad student of where our collective awareness tends to be as a society. We're conditioned not to think about or even question where our food comes from. So for me, on my long path, it's more and more about educating and increasing people's awareness. And as an ethical vegan, the core of my advocacy is about widening and expanding upon our innate compassion for all living beings. Thank you so much, Joanne. And before I move on, I would love to quickly ask everyone to participate in our very first poll question, which is, where are you in the dietary spectrum? So how would you identify your diet choices for the most part? Um, as not vegan, but curious, pescatarian, so vegetarian, but also eats fish, vegetarian, vegan, or none of the above. We appreciate your uh, participation, no matter what your dietary spectrum choice is. But thank you so much for taking a second to share that with us. 
Um, and next, I would love to introduce Thomas Goodman, please. Hello everyone. Um, I first want to thank each and every one of you for generously taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us tonight. You could be doing anything else, but you're seeking out this information, creating this collaboration, learning from one another, and just sharing your feedback so how we can relay this even better moving forward. Um, and just a little bit about myself. Uh, I actually was raised meat free since birth. My mother was a devoted animal rights activist and I grew up going to protests and doing lots of activism for animals. And as I got older, I started to see what were ways to help bring people on board, to help create these conversations where we're listening to one another and showing just the positive reinforcement for adding plant-based options into your diet. I have uh, professional experience full-time since 2014 working in this space. I've worked on Capitol Hill. I've traveled the country giving presentations on plant-based eating. I've done things from leafleting, from corporate outreach, from campaigning across the board. And I've really seen the last five years, people are seeking out plant-based options. People really think about price, taste, and convenience. And now we can really offer that. You know, being in Richmond in 2008, and I remember going to Kroger and they had the first ever plant-based pizza. I was so excited and I tried it and I was like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. I don't know if everyone's going vegan. Um, and now here we are today in 2021, it's just mind blowing how wonderful this has all come, come to the forefront. And it's because of you, how you share your dollars every time you go to the grocery store. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to be here with you all today. Thank you so much. We really appreciate having you. Um, and our next panelist, Tim Wright, who I have known for 26 years if not maybe a little longer, um, who is a very good friend and colleague and also a graduate of VCU. And um, yeah, tell us a bit about yourself, Tim. Yeah, thank you, Chrissy and everyone uh, who's joined today. Yeah, the, I, I think this year, 2021 is, uh, I think I've been vegan for 25 years and a, a huge part of that was because of the, a person I was called Chrissy. Uh, and so I think, Part of, part of veganism in individuals is relationships between folks. And um, that's, you know, I don't work in the, you know, in a vegan related industry. I'm an educator, I'm a historian. I'm a actually a tour guide here in Washington, DC, but my community here is vegan. And a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, interpersonal relationships. And so for me, you know, I think over the last quarter century, it has been a revelation to me how, pervasive and known the vegan lifestyle and diet has become. And just the, the fact that we're having a World Vegan Day discussion um, hosted by VCU is just really special to me. Uh, and so definitely want to elaborate more on, you know, sort of my journey. I love Joanne said the word journey because that's really what it is. It's, it has never been a complete finished part of my life. It's always been an ongoing journey. And so I do want to talk about that in a little bit later, but um, yeah, just happy to have everyone here. Um, thank, thank you for all the other panelists. And um, should I, you know, do you just want me to jump right into talking about, okay, great. So yeah, yeah I did want to talk a little bit about sort of the cultural aspects of being vegan. Uh, as I said, this was uh, 25 years ago, I was graduating from high school and I was trying to become vegan <laughs> because uh, I had grown up with in a music scene, a cultural scene in Richmond, Virginia, downtown Richmond, Virginia, that sort of promoted this idea of compassion for increasing compassion, creating space for compassion within our human communities and also, you know, animal communities, you know, the, the animals around us, right? So I always loved animals and the idea of being compassionate was very compelling to me. And so uh, amongst other things, I ended up adopting a vegan lifestyle and a vegan diet. And it was really tough. Uh, I, most of my family hadn't really heard of it. Uh, I came from a family of farmers that, you know, farmed uh, and still does actually um, soybeans, corn, wheat, sorghum, uh, all kinds of stuff that comes out of the ground. And so like vegetables, you know, whole food stuff growing out of the ground was always a part of my life, but veganism itself wasn't a part of my life or really a part of anyone in my family at the time. So all of my vegan 
friends and uh, compatriots were from school and from the Richmond community. And so it was a little bit of me learning and then also me teaching the people around me about it. And I was very lucky. Uh, my family, my parents, even though I was in high school and I still lived under the roof of my parents, they were very supportive. And so I was able to try it out. And it was an instant. I tried, I learned, I failed, I tried again. And by the time I got to VCU, it was a real consistent thing where I felt like, hey, I can do this full time and started that journey, which is still going today. And so over the last quarter century, to me, it's been much easier to be to be vegan. And I, you, for me, I don't think you have to live in a city to be vegan. I used to believe like, oh, you gotta live in New York, you gotta live in San Francisco, you gotta live in DC or Philadelphia. I no longer think that's true. I think you can really do it anywhere. Uh, and so I do feel fortunate that we are able to, you know, to live the lifestyle without bending over backwards or being wealthy. I know maybe we'll talk, maybe some folks will talk about that later, but there's a, a whole bunch of misconceptions I'd love to talk about, including that you have to be, spend a lot of money to be vegan, which is not true. Uh, and then just this idea of going back to the basics, increasing compassion, like if, to lessen suffering, to increase compassion, being vegan for me is part of that. And so it was never like, well, you know, can I, can I, you know, give up this food or is there a vegan, you know, version of this food? It was all about, making the choices that sort of lessen suffering. But then along the way, it became easier to do those things. And so it was almost like second nature. And so, um, you know, the only pushback I really got in the beginning was from, weirdly enough, my pediatrician, because I, I, I was a varsity baseball player in high school. And so he was weirdly using uh, that as sort of a, a question mark to whether or not I should not, uh, you know, eat animal products. But, um, I, you know, I told him I was going to try to stick with it and he ended up being supportive of it. And then, you know, once I go off into college, obviously I'm sort of making my own choices about my health. Uh, and so I continue to do that. So, you know, culturally to me, it's gotten easier. I haven't, you know, I know there are probably folks that are, will have questions about like, what do you do in awkward social situations or someone invites you to their home? You know, they, what do you do to me? I just, it's part of my personality now. And so I don't feel awkward about saying, you know, I understand like you're serving your barbecue. I don't eat meat, you know, I'm vegan. And so to me, it's not an awkward thing. It's just like, it's part of who I am. And so I'm not, you know, it's not an awkward thing. It's like, you're just sharing yourself with the other person. Uh, and so, you know, true friends and neighbors, like they're going to be okay with it. Right. So to me, it's not an awkward thing. Um, but yeah, cult culturally, I do think it's just, it's just gotten easier. I mean, that's really sort of, I, I go back to that, but even just thinking about running around as a little kid or on Schaefer Court, which I hope is still a thing down in Richmond, but running around around Schaefer Court and trying to go to the VCU food hall. And in 1996, we, could, we couldn't really even get anything. Like even the rice wasn't vegan, you know, in the food hall at the time. And so we were really, really trying to piece it together piecemeal. And I haven't been on campus in a long time, but I assume it's probably a lot easier to get, you know, a full vegan meal there. So. I, it was, it, you know, every little, and Thomas mentioned this, every little step along the way, it was just, you know, a progress, hacker progress. And it was little cultural things like, you know, the coffee shop started to offer soy milk. Um, VCU started to have meals that were vegan just by nature. A restaurant opened. The grocery store started to carry, you know, this product or this product or this product. And over years, it just snowballed. And so, although it is a journey still, it's a much easier journey to me than, um, than it was a quarter century ago. So it has gotten better. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll pause there because I want to hear from the other panelists. But uh, for me, the, the, the main thing is lessons, suffering, um, increases compassion, and that it has gotten easier over time. So uh, I really enjoy the lifestyle. Really would love to hear from the other panelists and all of your all of y'all's questions too as we go on. So thank you for listening. I think you touched on something really important because there is this uh, fear and concern about how others might react and respond. And I loved that you 
talked about what worked for you that you, instead of being self-righteous or judgmental, you took the time to explain to folks why you made those choices. Um, and I think that's what makes a really big difference is that when, or if with anything we, we might choose in life, if we come across as sort of self, self-righteous and judgmental, folks do feel um, defensive or, you know, and judged and um, kind of put up a wall. But when we explain it in a way of, you know, this is out of love and care and compassion. And um, it's something I do for myself. I do for the animals. I do for the earth. And um, I think when we present it that way, it really, it really kind of lays this foundation for, for people to be a lot more accessible to having conversations and to understanding and appreciating it. Yeah, I think that's a really important important piece. Thank you. And um, I'm going to be able to sort of make some connections in there too with adding in the health health aspect, Tim, because you'd mentioned your pediatrician. And I will definitely talk about this a little bit later um, as a parent of a vegan child and also just educating myself over the years about how much nutrition information doctors have and um, just kind of that general information that the average physician has to go on and um, why that can be a bit of an issue. So I'm glad you mentioned that so I can talk about that in a little bit. Thank you so much. Um, can we go ahead and move on to you, Thomas? Yes, I sorry, I was having to close out the uh, question up. But yes, I'm so excited to jump in. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of information in a short amount of time. So um, more, most importantly, if anyone has any questions, please message me after. But I'm going to go through the wide spectrum of the financial growth in the plant-based industry. So first and foremost, plant-based meat alternatives. Um, in the last five years, it's already been eloquently touched on in this presentation, have been substantial. Um, you know, a long time ago, we were focusing on putting up billboards and really scrounging together to hand out leaflets to raise awareness of plant-based eating. And now the meat industry leading fast food chains are putting up commercials every five minutes during sporting events or reality TV highlighting plant-based alternatives. And while that's even amazing because we do not have the funding to pay for those um, advertisements, but the credibility of the meat industry and these companies say, hey, this tastes great. It's the same texture, smell, convenience. It's what you want. And we're putting it in our supply chain for you, the consumer. So it's just so inspiring to see that, you know, companies such as Burger King, you know, Walmart, um, Ikea, Disney, it's just a wide spectrum. So wherever you are, especially with big corporate chains, there's a great chance that plant-based food is available there. Thinking about the leather industry, um, you know, you think about companies such as Tesla who are changing their leather, or if you go to different even leather companies who are offering pineapple leather or um, leather made from mushrooms. I mean, it's just astonishing what we're using with technology. And there's new leather coming out that's coming from bacon and it just, uh, from, from seaweed that could also be made into bacon. So the fact is that we have so many products that are being innovative by the leather industry. It, it's just so heartwarming and it's all based on people asking for compassionate changes when they want to purchase leather. Um, even thinking about celebrities, celebrities are jumping aboard the a vegan train or the plant-based train. It's people who aren't even fully vegan. Um, you know, we have people like Chris Paul, Oprah, Ellen DeGeneres, um, you know, LeBron James, Tom Brady. You know, if you want to eat how Tom Brady eats for a day, go to purplecarrot.com and you get to see what he's eating for the day. It's so cool that athletes and celebrities are co-signing on this movement. And if anyone saw the Oscars, Joaquin Phoenix, after winning um, movie of the year for Joker, he used an entire platform to talk about how the dairy industry is. And so celebrities are really putting themselves out there and it brings me a lot of joy. Um, and you just look about like just the projections by uh, 2040, it could be potentially worth $140 billion. I mean, that seems like so far away, but this is right around the corner. If anyone is in 
uh, interested in IPOs. The largest and fastest growing IPO ever was Beyond Meat in its first week, which you think about every product and every company that's ever been created. Beyond Meat was so ubiquitous that it broke through the mold and it's showing. It's just something that we are just scratching the surface of what's to come. And you just think about local restaurants. Over 51% of chefs with a survey of over 3,000 chefs have said that they've added plant-based options and their sales have gone up on average 13% by adding plant-based sales. So it's, it's just really showing that when you're going out to a restaurant, Meatless Mondays is great, or even just adding one or two options in your dinner that are plant-based. That's what people are asking for in 2021. Um, and if you think about on a corporate level, you know, you see, you know, restaurants, retailers, food trucks, food drives, you know, catering companies, uh, K through 12 districts, you know, there's so many institutions, even correction facilities are adding plant based options. And so it's really something that I think is going to bring this to the forefront when when you have a company like Aramark saying that they want to be 25% plant-based for the next three years. I mean, think about the influence they have on universities throughout the country. And so while it's amazing, we're doing all this wonderful work with individual dietary change, but companies themselves, they're also saying like, hey, let's jump on board and let's bring this uh, to the forefront. And lastly, thinking about just from a financial standpoint, the meat industry, they are all in on plant-based food. And this kind of is a conundrum because on one hand, you know, myself, I grew up protesting Tyson and Cargill and Purdue. Uh, I've gone to, you know, dozens and dozens of vigils. Um, it's been a big part of my life growing up. Um, now it's seeing that they're purchasing companies. And at first I was like overwhelmed. I was like, what's happening here? Is this a good thing? But now I've really soaked it in and the distribution opportunities that the meat industry has, the, the vast resources and opportunities to drive the cost down of plant-based products is overwhelming. And so still support vegan restaurants, but also don't feel guilty supporting plant-based products that come from the meat industry as well. So there's so much I could rant on about, but if you want to chat further about the plant-based financial industry, I would love to hear from you after the presentation. Thank you. And I think one of the really important pieces to that um, point about accessibility and how much, uh, how many options there are out there and they're just so accessible. And it reminded me of a really important point I wanted to make is that, um, and you mentioned this actually about some of the celebrities, is that um, if being vegan all the time right now isn't what you're ready to dive right into, being vegan some of the time makes a difference. If it's five days a week, if it's a couple days a week, if it's most of your meals, um, even if it's all of your dinners, it's really making a difference for the animals, for the environment, and for your health. So I think that's really important to think about, especially because these options are so much more accessible. They're so much more affordable and um, it's just easier than ever now, which is really, really great. Um, I wanted to take a look at our first poll question real quick, just in regard to our participants. Um, okay, so this is great. So the majority of folks participating are not vegan, but curious, which is really, really awesome. Um, and then we've got some vegans, vegetarians, pescatarians. Um, so we're really grateful for this really diverse group of folks participating. That's what we wanted. We didn't want a presentation just for vegans. We definitely wanted vegans to participate, um, but love, love that we have a really great variety. Um, so real quick, our second poll question, what is, if you are vegan, or what would you imagine the biggest obstacle being um, if you went vegan or if you are vegan? So would it be finding these really desirable food options that you currently love, but in a plant-based option, um, concerns about nutrition, um, issues with family, friends, colleagues, and kind of that social cultural aspect, um, or feeling socially awkward if you don't have a lot of vegan and vegetarian friends. Um, all of these, or maybe none of these. So we'd love to hear what you think um, are obstacles for you if you're vegan, or what you would imagine would be obstacles for choosing a vegan lifestyle. 
Um, but this is a great opportunity for me to just pop in and talk about some of the health issues because honestly, in all of the years that I have been doing tabling and education around veganism with vegan action, one of the most significant inquiries and concerns I hear from folks is the nutrition piece. And it does make sense. And that's what I was mentioning earlier is, um, this isn't a, um, cruel critique of physicians, but it's it's just a factual critique that most um, MDs are only required a few hours of nutrition to get their general medical license. Um, and so nutrition isn't a really big part, um, which is very unfortunate because we know that preventative medicine is really the most powerful medicine. Um, and so it is really unfortunate that a lot of the medical doctors and physicians um, don't have all of that really important general information, but that is changing. So that's another thing we've seen changing in the last 25 years, definitely in the last 10 years, where physicians are absolutely starting to incorporate diet as part of preventative care and um, curing care. And so there are folks that have actually reversed diabetes because of changing their diet. Folks that have greatly reduced cancer risks because of changing their diet to plant-based, whole plant-based food diet, um, changing um, their uh, positive impacts with rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, positive impacts, for, again, for folks that um, have heart disease, COPD. Um, it's, it's just this endless array of diseases that are affecting folks in the US that are very much diet related to begin with um, and that can be really greatly improved by a plant-based diet. Um, and whole food, well-rounded, diverse plant-based diets have no cholesterol, they're low in sodium, they're low in saturated fat, they're high in protein, they're high in calcium, they're high in all of these vitamins and minerals that we require. The two supplements that are recommended for everyone to take, whether you are a hardcore meat eater, pescatarian, vegetarian, vegan, are vitamin D and B12. And that is for everyone. Um, and especially the vitamin D, um, most of us, hopefully, when we're out and about are using sunscreen. And um, because generally exposure to the sun helps us process vitamin D, but a lot of us are living far from the equator, have darker skin, or are using sunscreen and are really careful and cautious about our sun exposure. And everyone should be taking vitamin D. Um, and B12, we have a really low need for B12. It's very minimal. A lot of foods are fortified with B12. And um, that is also recommended to take a supplement of that. And again, that is for everyone, whatever your diet may be. Um, and um, so we often get the question about protein, which again is a very fair question because we have this general idea that we've all grown up with um, between what doctors have had to say and commercials um, that uh, we're, we need to have, um, we need to eat meat and we need to drink milk to have proper protein and proper calcium. Um, and we have found that those two things in particular, meat and dairy, are actually the greatest food contributors to decreased health. And so doctors really are getting on board with this. Um, one of my favorite organizations and um, a reference I use very regularly is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. They are an amazing group out of Washington, D.C., um, and it is a coincidence, but it's an awesome coincidence that Tim's partner actually works there. And um, they have just the most wonderful um, science-based, fact-based, research-based data on how a plant-based diet can really benefit our health. And um, as I mentioned, reduce major heart disease risk, cancer risk, as well as reverse some negative um, health issues that folks 
are, are experiencing. So it's it's really incredibly powerful. And it is really a paradigm shift to start to think about food as truly being preventative medicine, but it really, it really is. And we just have to start seeing it that way. Um, so I hope that we can get to a few questions later on today, because again, that's a really common area where folks inquire about um, being healthy and being vegan. And as I'd mentioned, I have a 16 year old who uh, born and raised vegan um, and is incredibly healthy. And just one anecdotal piece to share is um, we do have a pediatrician that is really supportive and really thoughtful. And um, he gets blood work done periodically as most of us do to just check our general health and well being. And um, he had some in house blood work done at his uh, pediatrician. And the nurse came back in and said, This is the best blood work I've actually ever seen. And um, it was really cool to experience. I wasn't surprised, but they were. And it was really great to have that opportunity for, for these folks in the office to recognize how healthy a vegan child is because they, they, they aren't seeing very many. Um, again, I think that's going to start changing as well, but that, that was really wonderful. So um, I'm happy to share some resources in our resource list later about vegan pregnancy, raising vegan children, and just being really healthy. Um, it's also really very affordable to eat a whole food plant-based diet, which is another great aspect. Um, and as Thomas mentioned, there are so many wonderful options and substitutes. Like if you name it, there's a plant-based option, which we're so grateful. You know, like Tim was mentioning when the coffee shops finally had soy milk and then they finally had uh, the tofu vegan cream cheese. And then they would, you know, so slowly there are these really great options available that we all love. Like there are so many delicious vegan ice cream options. It's hard to choose, um, but there used to only be two. And um, so there are, there's delicious plant-based bacon and chicken and, you know, again, name it. And vegan cheese finally has made it. It's delicious. It's amazing. So grateful for all of these options. However, it is still processed food and, um, and it's expensive. So why, you know, I, I view those as sometimes foods. Um, if I'm having a craving, I really want a, um, fried chicken sandwich, I go and get my garden and I make a delicious chicken sandwich at home. Um, but in general, and this is for health reasons and for cost reasons, um, I am buying whole food plant-based. I'm buying tofu. I'm making that at home. I'm buying my beans, my rice, my fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so there's like, there's, there, there are these three aisles that I generally go to in the grocery store where I'm buying most of my stuff. And every now I'll get those sometimes things um, that are special treats. Or if I go out to eat, I'm thrilled that there's a vegan burger, a delicious vegan burger, um, or a vegan lasagna available on a menu somewhere, which is really exciting. It's a really great treat. Um, but making those um, choices of still not eating too many processed foods is, is important as well, especially when we're talking about the health issue and the cost issue. Um, so those are, those are important things to keep in mind as well. Um, and yeah, just sharing these, this information with friends and family that might be concerned, um, which they, they're coming from a good place. Their, their concern is definitely legitimate. Um, but being able to share these benefits, especially having those really good, valuable resources to share is really helpful. So um, yeah, so please don't forget about our resource, resource page um, that we're gonna share with all of you. Um, and lastly, I would, but not least, I would love to introduce Dr. Joanne Kong, and she's going to talk to us about the environment and how our food choices really make a difference. Thanks, Chrissy, for all that great information. And the way, you know, you were talking about whole food plant-based, and a lot of people somehow have this misconception that animal flesh, animal products has to be the center of, of what you eat. But really, 
plant foods have really unique qualities that you're never going to find in animal products. One of them is fiber, you know, that you go to the, I always say, go to the grocery section, uh, the produce section, eat the rainbow, all the different colors of the fruits and vegetables that you see reflect the phytochemicals that have special powers for healing our bodies and fiber helps to reduce blood sugar, lower cholesterol, drag out uh, the LDLs, the harmful cholesterol and so many uh, other benefits. So, um, so great to hear all of this. And talking now about briefly about the environment, we know that over the past year and a half, we've been preoccupied with this pandemic and with climate change, we've really come to a point, I call it an inflection point where we really needed to seriously question our food production systems, not only for our health, but the health of the planet. And you know, in spite of the fact that we're seeing more and more damaging climate events happening with drought, wildfires, storms, floods, hurricanes, we, you know, as a whole, we don't see the massive deforestation that's taking place to grow crops for livestock. We don't see species going extinct. We don't see the decimation taking place below the surface of our oceans. But the facts are now, they're indisputable that animal agriculture is the most destructive industry on earth. It is a leading cause of climate change, species and habitat loss, resource loss and depletion. It's the number one cause of ocean dead zones, pollution, desertification, antibiotic resistance, and world hunger. A global move to plant-based eating could save 70 to 80% of the land, water, and energy resources currently devoted to livestock production. I do wish that all could take this pandemic we've been going through as a warning shot because over 75% of infectious diseases are related to animal exploitation. In fact, there are now currently about eight types of avian flu now existing in factory farms around the world with the potential to be more lethal than COVID-19. Some of you may have heard of Dr. Michael Greger, who's you know, one of the top plant-based docs, and there are so many out there now. He says that every animal in a factory farm is like a test tube, capable of brewing up the next virus. So that's why your individual choice as a consumer will have tremendous impact. And Thomas has already spoken about you know, what, what your dollars can do. We can send a message that going plant-based is not only for health, it's for the planet, it's for the animals. So the thing about going vegan is that it's a change we can make right now. We don't need to wait for policy and global leaders to step up and they're always gonna be slow to act. And of course, they're influenced to such a large degree from the profit-driven meat and dairy industries. But we as individuals are making a choice. You know, we're making the choice that we're becoming more and more aware of the power of food for a more sustainable life. So we have to keep moving forward and bring all of this to full public awareness. Lots of times people are talking about the, you know, vegan advocates are saying that, you know, the fact that policy leaders don't want to talk about it, it's like the elephant in the room. Actually, a better term has been suggested by Dr. Salish Rao, who is uh, the leader of climate healers. He is right now at the UN's climate conference that currently is taking place in Glasgow, Scotland. And Dr. Rao calls it the cow in the room. Unfortunately, the agenda of the climate conference does not even have animal agriculture on its agenda. And in fact, they are still serving animal products to the delegates. And there's not even one single mention of animal agriculture in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, we know that addressing fossil fuels, renewable energies, uh, refashioning our transportation systems, yes, those are parts of the solution, 
But the truth is this, with meat consumption expected to double by 2050 and approaching a $10 billion, uh, 10 billion population amount by 2050, we won't be able to sustain our existence on this planet without addressing the food issue. So I just would like to conclude by saying that for a lot of people who are not yet vegan, and I like to call them pre-vegans, oftentimes they'll say that, oh, well, my diet, it's a personal choice. But what could be more powerful and consequential than making a choice not to be complicit in taking the life of another being? and making a choice that affects the very sustainability of our planet and future generations. Some of you may know about Chef AJ, who's absolutely amazing. She has this wonderful saying, she says, your plate is the world's fate. I do love that saying. It's really, it's really captures it all. And um, I'm grateful that you mentioned the issue of food insecurity, because it is a really big part of um, this issue. And um, so, and it is something I, I like to talk about when I have the opportunity that the fact that there is food insecurity in, in the world, especially in first world countries, um, is not related to a lack of food. It is food distribution and how we're growing and using food. And that is directly related to animal agriculture, that we are growing so much of the grains and corn and soybeans to feed to other animals to then feed to people instead of using the land to grow food for people. And it is a really big significant issue. And another thing that is not being discussed. Um, so land use is, is really huge and that rainforests are being taken down, raised at, at an astronomical rate in order to um, hold and graze cows. Um, so it's a really big piece of, of this really large issue that a lot of folks don't know. And um, that's a really important piece to, to consider. So I'm grateful for that quote. Um, I think we need t-shirts with that quote, <laughs> to be honest. I love it. I love it. Um, thank you so much. And um, on that note, I would love to know what our results are of um, our poll question number two. Um, okay, so this this the, the the results are pretty consistent to what I would say I experience when I'm talking to the general public when I'm tabling for vegan action. So definitely questions and concerns about proper nutrition. Um, and so I think that's great. That's important because that's a key part of choosing plant-based and make sure you're doing it well and feeling good about it. So it's not just eating fries and cereal and pasta because nobody's going to feel good if that's all you're eating. So um, I'm grateful that that is a concern that people have, that they want to make sure they're eating well and doing it right. So that's, that's important. Um, and then the second uh, most common obstacle is finding an abundance of these desirable food options. And so I think that's a really good question too, is um, sometimes when I do cooking demos, one of my favorite things to make is lentil tacos. Um, so lentil tacos are a really great, or lentil, seasoned lentils are a really great substitute for ground beef. And I've learned over the years that a lot of people have never had lentils, which of course to me being vegan for as long as I have, I am immediately a little bit surprised, but then I'm like, well, you know, a lot of us grew up with certain foods and that's what we end up just cooking and eating as we become adults. And it's just kind of habit and what we're familiar with. Um, so an important part of um, learning about what plant-based foods are available and accessible is branching out, out a little bit and trying new things, trying quinoa, which is really delicious um, and expanding your 
cooking skills and trying to cook and make new things that you maybe you haven't tried before. So checking out some really fun food blogs and trying some new recipes because all of the substitutes are there. So baking your favorite thing, but making it vegan, easy as can be. And I'm telling you anything and everything that you make at home right now, you can do vegan and it's going to be just as delicious and really easy. So um, I'm glad that a lot of you had pointed that out in, in the poll. That's, that's really, really great. So again, please don't forget about the resources that we're sharing. Um, so I, I would love to know for those of you that are vegetarian or vegan, um, what motivated you to make that choice? Um, or what would motivate you to make that choice or sort of go in that direction? Like, what is it that drives you the most? Um, a lot of, a lot of folks that I know, um, it, genuinely choose that initially for ethical reasons or learning about the animal suffering piece. Um, but I'm meeting more and more folks that choose vegan for the health benefits first and foremost. Um, and some folks do it out of, make that choice out of being practical. Um, so it could be just as easy and just as practical, but just not using these animal products anymore. So we'd love to hear what that motivating piece might be for you. Um, and we definitely still have some time for a little bit of Q and A. Um, and Larry, if you could lead us into that, um, that would be great. Okay, can you guys hear me? Um, first question is for Thomas. And um, we one of the questions we got in the Q and A is, do you think it's best to focus time and resources on food tech instead of grassroots? Uh, first, whomever asked that, that's such um, an integral question. I'm so glad that you did. Um, and I hate to be cliche, but you cannot have one without the other. On one hand, you know, we can create the, the vast options that we have and with different um, avenues that we already are tapping into going to 2022 with even lab grown meat. I mean, things are just going to just spiral to the places where we could officially end factory farming in 20 years in the United States. I mean, it's just, it's right here in the precipice, but at the same time, we still need the grassroots outreach going to local restaurants and not even just local restaurants, but national chains. There's so many product launches happening all over the country. For instance, at Plant Dining Partnerships, we are urging Wendy's to carry a plant-based burger uh, alternative. And so what we do is we work with volunteers all throughout the country to go into the three locations, Jacksonville, um, Columbus, um, in Pittsburgh, who currently are test trialists, and say, hey, I want this option. You only need 10 people a day to ask for this option to keep it on the menu to go nationwide. And so, and these actual launches are usually in locations that may not be as progressive, who may be less open-minded for maybe even these plant-based alternatives. And so if they're successful there, then it goes nationwide. So I am very, very excited what's happening. Uh, there's products coming out, especially for me, that brings me the most joy is seeing in the plant-based seafood industry, Good Catch Foods are releasing products that are just so overwhelmingly good. And we've been waiting for a couple of years to reach that. And also from an altruistic perspective, whenever we save chickens, you know, of obviously 9 billion animals eat in the United States every year, roughly, unfortunately, 88% of them are chickens. So whenever I see plant-based chicken alternatives, I am so excited to see this. And so I recommend go do activism locally, going to local restaurants and even bringing your friends and people call it the vegan veto card. Say, hey, I wanna bring my friends and there's 12 of us, but unfortunately you don't have any vegan options. What can we do? And quick plug, it's a shameless plug, but please message us at plantdiningpartnerships.com and we will drive advertisement sales to those local restaurants to carry those plant-based options and continue this conversation. So we would love to hear from you if you're interested in doing activism. Thank you, Thomas. Um, another question, um, and any of the panelists can address it. Um, please address lunchbox menus for elementary age children. I'm happy to answer that one as a as a vegan parent. Um, so yeah, my son is 16, and we've he packed his lunch his whole life, um, and so. 
I, I have found it to be pretty easy. Um, I think one of the parts, one of the pieces that has made it easy is that he did grow up vegan. So having that palate already, like eating hummus starting from when he was two and eating a really good variety of beans and fruits and vegetables. Um, but I would say some of the easiest things are just chopped up fresh fruits and vegetables, hummus, soy or coconut yogurt. Um, and then sometimes I would actually do a little bit of stir fry um, dinner, leftover dinner. So uh, there's almost always something hot I would have in a small little um, insulated, I can't, I think of what those are called. Um, what is that called? I can't remember. Um, <laughs> thermos, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Yes, thermos. So small little insulated thermos. So there would always be a stir fry, a chili, a soup, something like that. Um, and just a just good variety of maybe some whole wheat crackers. So there is a really great cookbook actually called The Vegan Lunchbox. Um, and that was a really good inspiration for me. It is... Um, Definitely a lot of the recipes are in there are great as a base. The person who did it like took it three extra levels and has like animal faces on things and maybe has a little had a little too much time than maybe the average person. Um, but you know, sometimes that's what it takes to, to get kids to eat certain things. Um, but definitely keeping it simple and whole food for the most part. But I, I always liked sending something nice and warm and delicious every day too. The next question is maybe we can kind of go around and everybody chime in. Um, what are your go-to resources to share with others who are thinking about starting the journey? You know, podcasts, recipe books, uh, websites, um, you know, we can just go around. I would recommend definitely, I mentioned Dr. Michael Greger, he wrote a book called How Not to Die. And not only is it filled with a lot of information about nutrition, he has something called the Daily Dozen. And it's fantastic. You can fit it on one page. It tells you how many servings you need of various whole fruits and vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds. And he even has a Daily Dozen app. So it's really easy to keep track of the amounts of all the healthy foods that you need to, um, to be eating. So that's my suggestion for a resource. Yeah, I love, um, and I, I think I've said this in the Q and A, the new farm cookbook, it is super classic. I think it's from like 1979 or 1980, really accessible ingredients. Um, you know, get it at Safeway, get it at Giant, get it at Kroger. You're going to be able to get all your ingredients, really simple recipes. My, my only, my advice really is just start small replace one ingredient with the vegan ingredient, replace one meal, replace one day, replace one week, but just go at your own pace. So just don't overwhelm yourself, start small, and then just go from there. Um, for myself, I love uh, recommending game changers. You know, oftentimes people are curious or like, you know, can you survive? But no, let's talk about how you thrive and just how top tier athletes, um, individuals who are, you know, Navy SEALs, um, and just sharing stories where we're, we're doing things that, you know, you see individuals who are, you know, 80 years old, and they have more energy than their grandkids, you know, and you just see that, no, no, it, it's not like our Oliver Twist voice saying like, oh, like, we can maybe get by, it, it's, it's healthy. No, like, you're going to be energized, you're going to be confident, you're going to go out there with a ton of energy to take on life, like, you know, come on, try these plant-based products, see how you feel after a couple of weeks. And I think Game Changers will really open many eyes on that front. There's also a couple other recent documentaries. Sea Spiracy um, will really open your eyes if you thought it was safe and fine to eat fish. You need to watch that documentary. Another brand new one is called Eating Our Way to Extinction who taught, that talks about the damaging effects of animal agriculture on the planet. So documentaries are a great resource too, to, to become educated and learn about all these issues. And um, I have one last question and I have to ask this because it was submitted by my sister and I'll never hear the end of it if I didn't ask it. But um, 
what options are available to help people who live in food deserts and don't have many grocery options um, in their vicinity to go vegan? Yeah, well, first I wanna address that. That is an area that is a glaring concern, like to be full transparency that we have right now in our movement that there are certain communities that do not have equal access to plant-based options outright. If you go even go to local retailers, there's not the same abundance of plant-based foods. With that said, now this is not the healthiest approach, but national chains across the country are carrying plant-based meat alternatives. And something to keep in mind is one thing that we do at Plant Dining Partnerships, we do cooking demos in food swamp communities where there's abundance of fast food chains, but not an abundance of, you know, local gardens or, or local retailers that have a ton of plant-based options. And so if this is something in a community where you're located, we would love to chat with you further. We have two advisor board members who focus on this exclusively. And it's a topic I really want our movement to continue to highlight because we want to make sure everyone, not just the Whole Foods community, but everyone all over the country have equal access to plant-based opportunities. I would love to um, mention also just the fact of how many more um, farmers markets and are are accepting EBT um, and how how much more accessibility we are starting to accessibility we are starting to see for folks um, and again farmers markets are in larger cities and have to do with accessibility as well. Um, but it's definitely becoming a little bit easier. Um, but, you know, okay. One of the things I did really want to address is um, just that a few folks have asked about tofu and soy. Um, if you don't mind me just popping that in really quick, um, because there's a huge myth about soy not being healthy, um, especially for women. And so I did want to talk about that. Quite a few folks asked that question. And um, I just wanted to emphasize that there are no reliable research studies that have shown that to be the case. So what we have found is actually soy can be very beneficial for women, um, especially women post breast cancer. Um, soy has proven to be very beneficial for um, folks that are, um, of course, for the basics of uh, protein, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Um, but also there is no evidence that has proven at all that soy is dangerous for women, especially. So I did want to emphasize that and say thank you very much for, for everyone that asked that question. That was, that, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, and also the poll question about motivation. Um, so the majority of folks have mentioned that the biggest motivating factor is becoming more aware of health benefits. Um, and then followed by sort of the practical logistical part of realizing it's actually not that difficult. It's pretty um, easy and logistically doable to cook and live without animals or animal byproducts, um, and then followed by learning more about animal suffering. So fortunately, we have a lot of documentaries that have been mentioned today that have addressed all of these issues that provide some really good information and inspiration for all of the possible reasons that, that folks might make that choice. And Chrissy, I think we can uh, wrap up. Okay, well, I want to say thank you to the panelists for taking time out of your evening to participate. And a really big thank you to everyone that has logged in and joined us live today. Thank you so much 
for uh, joining us, for asking really great questions, participating in our poll questions, and help us understand better who has joined us tonight. Um, we would love to have some feedback from you. We will be emailing you an evaluation if you don't mind taking the time to fill that out and provide us with um, your thoughts and information. We'd love to keep doing this every year uh, and maybe a few, few times uh, throughout the year. So any information that you could share with us, we would really, really appreciate it. Um, and Larry will be reaching out to the winner of the Whole Foods gift card as well. So thank you all so much. And um, please have a great rest of your evening and a great rest of your week. <laughs>